Stressed out? Need sleep? The cold weather bringing out those aches and pains or arthritis? There's never been a better time to try cannabis. Check out the greenhouse of Walled Lake and learn about the natural way to relax and escape all that 2020 stress. The greenhouse is locally owned and they love helping people who are new to cannabis. They've got a great flower selection of the best Michigan grown buds and the biggest pre-roll selection around. Don't want to smoke? No problem. There's vape carts, tinctures, concentrates, and everyone's favorite, edibles, like gummies, chocolates, peppermint bark, breath sprays, even the original Mackinac Island fudge. So check out the greenhouse of Walled Lake. 21 and over welcome, no med card needed. They also offer senior and veterans discounts and have a great loyalty rewards program. The Greenhouse of Walled Lake. That's greenhousemi.com. Hey, good day, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to the week that was on Deadline Detroit. I am your host, Craig Folly. Glad to have you with me this week. We've got a lot to talk about, as per usual, given the strangeness and the times that we are living in right now. I would like to welcome my wonderful panelists. As always, we have Alan Langle, who is the editor and founder of Deadline Detroit, joining hello. us today. Hello, sir. Hello, hello. Nancy Derringer, Deadline Detroit contributor, is with us as usual once again. We appreciate it. And two returning guests today, Candace Fortman of Outlier Media. Hello, Candace. Hey there. And also Susan Demas of the Michigan Advance. Welcome back. Thanks. It's a pleasure to have you all here. And just before we get into this, I just want to make a show announcement. Obviously, a week from today is Christmas Day. We will not be having a show on that day, but we are planning a year that was special that will run sometime between Christmas and New Year's. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do on that show, I think, because I've opened it up to the public. I have a Facebook thread out there right now where I asked you the viewers, listeners, whatever you want to call yourselves, to nominate your Schmuck of the Year nominees. And there are obviously some big favorites out there, but I was thinking that we could spend that year in review episode going over those candidates and judging them and deciding maybe once and for all who is indeed the Schmuck of the Year. <laughs> now, that could be a lot of fun, and it will make for a good broadcast, I think, and something to give you something to look forward to in 2021 when many of these Schmucks are in the rearview mirror, hopefully. So should, anyway. we, uh, should we clarify and say no one from Deadline Detroit is eligible as a candidate? <laughs> hey, look, I, I, I put myself out there every week and somebody can nominate me if they want to. I don't have a problem with that. This goes with the territory. Uh, if you're going to spout off about things, expect to get some of it back. But that's the way that it goes. And I'm OK with that. But I just want to let folks know that we will have that. And I'll put more information about it on Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, uh, when we get close to having a, a, an airtime for that one. Because, you know, you got to work around everybody's holiday schedules. But what are you going to do? All right. Hey, this week, uh, let's talk about this because we did have some hope in the on the COVID front this week uh, with, of course, the rolling out of the Pfizer vaccine. And it looks like we're now going to get approval today, as a matter of fact, for the Moderna vaccine. Um, there are some logistical hiccups, obviously, but it was pretty exciting to see some of those frontline healthcare workers getting those shots, uh, being protected because they've been putting themselves on the line for months and months now and, uh, and, and basically exposing themselves to a lot of problems. You know, but but if there is no clear sign that we are not out of the woods yet, Benny Napoleon passed away yesterday, Wayne County Sheriff. I mean, he was 65 years old. He was a pretty healthy guy. I've known him for a long time. Uh, really, really saddened to see this happen. Uh, but, you know, I hate to say it, but is this the kind of thing that gets people's attention finally? I, I, you know, Candace, I mean, he was a, a pretty well-liked figure here in Metro Detroit for a long, long time. And this is a pretty big name uh, that, you know, a lot of people don't really relate to these things unless they see somebody whose name they know fall victim to this. Sure. So, I mean, Benny Napoleon is beloved by Detroiters. I mean, he has been a part of folks who are my age. He's been a part of our lives for as long as we can remember. Um, but I do think that for Detroiters, we got a clear message in March and April when we were losing people uh, the same at the same stature of Benny Napoleon left and right. This is not a message that Detroiters needed to get. Um, this is a message that folks outside of Detroit need to get. And I'm not sure if Benny Napoleon is the figure to help that message get across. When we talk about the idea of black bodies dying and it not being a connector for folks outside of Detroit, that is a very real thing. Um, and it's something that after this virus is over, we're going to have to address. Um, I think it speaks to our um, massive issues in healthcare discrepancy and disparities uh, anyhow. Um, so I'm not sure Benny Napoleon is going to be the message that gets people to put a mask on who at this point 
on December, what is today? December 19th? What is today? I don't know. If you're still not wearing a mask on December 18th, I don't think you're going to be wearing a mask just because Benny Napoleon has sadly lost his life. Well, well, let's talk to the person who's outside of the city of Detroit right now. And Susan, I mean, um, you know, obviously Benny Napoleon is known to us because we are people that follow politics. This is our job, obviously. But, you know, you've still got people protesting the health director, you know, right. and, and in front of his house saying that, you know, open the state and, and uh, you know, talking about tyranny. Uh, is this message something that is getting through up there or not? Well, last night when news broke of the sheriff dying, the uh, Republican-led legislature passed more measures to try and make it harder to respond to COVID. So clearly they didn't get any message. Um, they still think that the governor should not have the power to close businesses, close schools, and they're still fighting her on that. So sadly, no. I mean, look, Donald Trump got COVID and that didn't seem to change any Republicans behavior. You know, all you kind of heard was, well, he recovered, so everything's fine. Um, maybe we'll get and we'll get the magic antibodies, too. So um, sadly, I think we're pretty much past the point of no return for 20 to 30 percent of the population. Well, I think I go ahead, I, well, I, I think uh, this is right. I mean, when you see like uh, President Trump recovers so quickly, his, his wife had it, his son had it, and they recover quickly. And, and so it sort of helps continue the narrative that this is all BS and it's being overplayed. And I don't know how with the numbers coming out of 3,600 people dying in a day, I don't know how you're so dismissive, but the, the narrative uh, by Trump and his his cronies is so strong that it, it sort of overrides, you know, the facts. And it's it's scary. It's been really frightening. As, as long as you don't know the people who are dying or the people that you know are dying are your grandparent or great-grandparent or somebody who is, you know, shall we say, uh, Medicare eligible, um, people are not going to pay attention to it. They just aren't. I mean, I think Susan and, and um, Candace were absolutely right. This is still seen by too many people as something that kills old people and black people. And as long as they don't have, you know, if, as long as that's not important to them, then they're going to they're going to do it. Right. It's gonna interesting. Herman Cain, who died, who happens to be black. Yeah. Right. Uh, and that's, you know, he did not. I was assuming he didn't get the same kind of a treatment that Rudy Giuliani has gotten, that Trump has gotten and all that. And it's just sort of written off as like, so what? He was yeah. Black. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I wonder, did anybody pay attention? I mean, it seems to me that normally any other uh, week, a story like we found out about, you know, this this push towards herd immunity within the White House, uh -huh. um, you know, would have been something that that would have, you know, killed somebody's political career saying we need to infect people talking about this herd immunity approach. I, I mean, that is basically being saying that you're willing to sacrifice a certain percentage of the population to accomplish this herd immunity. And I understand the whole the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few argument that they're trying to make here. It doesn't make it humane in any way, shape or form. Uh, clearly, they were wanting this to go this way. And, and he was the president was being advised that this was the smart strategy when, frankly, curbing this is a lot easier than that. You don't have to make sure people die. Just wear masks, socially distance. Uh, all these things, which were so much easier than basically potentially infecting a huge chunk of the population. And the, the, nobody really paid much attention to the fact that these memos are out there that said this. Uh, Craig, a tan suit almost brought a president down in this country just a few years ago. And now saying that it's OK to kill a whole swath of the population, it's like, hey, you know, sometimes people got to die. <laughs> Insanity. Like, and it's hard for me to understand this timeline we're living in right now in America. I can't wait for sociologists to do what they do. Uh, I'll be an old lady by the time they can figure all of this out, but I'll be happy and hopefully I can still understand and read because I can't wait to see what they come up with. This is a ridiculous timeline for America. I don't disagree with that point at all. I, I just think it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how history sort of treats our response to this and, and what we did and did not do. But uh, the fact that there were actual people in the White House that were urging the president to take this approach to it and they were listening to it.
uh, is is just shocking to me. Um, you know, uh, every day you just look at the news and you wonder if it's real. I mean, you know, this is the monstrous stuff that people contemplate in sci-fi novels, and we live it every day. Um, and I think we're just so inured to the crazy that <laughs> sometimes it doesn't even fully register. But, well, um, you know, in normal times, um, this should bring down the careers of many, many people and be viewed on the level of mass tragedies. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about, you know, uh, I think it was AOC or somebody else was talking about, let's make sure that we remember who all these people are so that when uh, Biden, you know, when the next administration comes in, they don't end up, you know, getting jobs and, and forgetting, you know, and everybody forgetting that they worked for the worst president in my lifetime and probably in your lifetimes. And they go, they all start going, cancel culture, cancel culture. And it's like, you know, come on. I mean, these people went, these they broke America in a lot of ways. Well, and, I, you know, here, here's I, here's I, another yeah. way we're here's another way we're broken. I mean, think about this: uh, the Russians basically hacked into every yes. important system that we have. Yes. Um, you know, somebody was asleep at the switch once again when it comes to Russia and uh, and hacking, and now the government's saying, "Hey, they've probably been coming in and out of our house stealing crap for six months, and we still don't even know what's gone." Yeah. That's basically what somebody compared this to yesterday that I saw. Uh, we have been infiltrated on on a number of levels. Um, the energy department, which basically has the nuclear information that we have, uh, treasury, uh, homeland security, mm -hmm. defense. I can't really think of anything else that they haven't gotten into that's really that important. But that seems to cover all of the important things right there. Yeah, it does. Uh, and, and the president has yet to say word one about this. I mean, Joe Biden saying, hey, I'm going to treat this like an act of war, like it is. The retaliation will be swift. As soon as I get into office, we're going to do something. I don't know what he's going to do. But, you know, you've got to hold somebody accountable. But Trump is just unwilling to do so. This is the th the uh, the book that I read. Um, I think it was late last year, maybe early this year, called The Fifth Risk. Uh, Michael Kelly's book, and he did exactly, he basically went into what some people still would call the deep state, but is essentially the vast workforce of, um, of federal workers whose job it is to basically run the federal government, right? And I think he concentrated on two, he concentrated on energy and agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would have been interesting if he had gone into health and human services, but he's not a seer, he didn't know we, were, we had a pandemic sitting on deck. And that was one of the things that he hit over and over is like, these people are doing important jobs that are vital for the security and safety of this country. And for, I mean, half of these, these departments aren't even, never got fully staffed. They didn't even get half staffed because, because the Trump administration comes in and their attitude is always the private sector can do it better. And it's like, Okay, you know, and then they turn it over to Jared Kushner and he adds it to his, you know, overstuffed portfolio. And so that's what probably happened. You, you want to know why the Russians wanted Donald Trump to win in 2016? We're seeing why right this minute. Well, I, 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 feel, I, I feel like if the administration had used Mr. Pillow more, I think they would have been more effective. <laughs> My, My pillow. pillow. Yeah, My yeah. Pillow, yeah. Well, you know, it, oh boy. Well, we'll get into him in just a little bit because he was one of these people that's been uh, at these rallies uh, talking oh, about yeah. stop the steal. Uh, those are still stuff. those are still going on, by the way. Um, and, and we'll talk about that a little later because uh, January sixth, everybody, January sixth. So we'll get into that, um, I think, a little bit later. But I, I do want to talk a, a bit about. Um, what is going on in the White House right now? As we mentioned, the president hasn't said word one about what is happening in Russia yet. Uh, Bill Barr has resigned as attorney general. Uh, the pl president's planning on, on vetoing the defense authorization bill. We may get a COVID package. Uh, it seems as if Congress at least is trying to get something done. But, you know, Donald Trump, until you can get rid of this guy, is going to find a way to to muck up the gears any way he can. Uh the defense authorization bill, he's going to veto this basically because he doesn't like the idea of Confederates names being taken off of military bases. Yeah. That's what yeah. this is about. That's, Are yeah. you kidding me? 
That's what this is about. We've just been attacked, cyber attacked, and yet you're not going to do the defense authorization bill because you want to take Robert E. Lee's name off of a couple of freaking bases. I mean, this is just, this is this is the level of pettiness that we're dealing with right now. And, and it doesn't seem like, okay, only 25, 30 days left or whatever. That's 30 days a of a time. lot of danger. A lot of, da- a lot of damage can be done in that That's time. That's a long time, and especially a long time for families who are already struggling. Mm-hmm. For folks who are about to hit evictions, for people who are already food insecure, 30 days is a very long time if you don't know where your next meal is coming from. I, you know what? I, I'm <laughs> curious. I'm curious in his pardons if he's going to pardon Kwame Kilpatrick. And I I somehow think that's a possibility. What? what, what mm-hmm. this, this Kwame can't do anything for him. <laughs> I, right. I, you know, these are all well, transactional. You, you can't you keep him out but, of any trouble. But, but no, you don't understand the. Uh, there is a there is a Republican Kabbalah there with a connection to Kwame and and including Rona Romney and she might she might just try to push for him. So. I I just I just don't see it. I mean, you know, everything that Trump is doing when it comes to pardons looks like it's somebody that can keep him out of trouble. Right. Um, and like I said, Arrive he's not a, a Sheriff Joe. Cash, if you want one. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Sheriff Joe was about winning Arizona. And that didn't work out too well for him, did? Yeah. But you know, hey, that was a calculated risk at the time. But seriously, who? Who might get pardoned here? There's all kinds of people. If he's talking oh, about pardoning the CFO at his uh, uh, at his organization, um, that's a smart move. Let's pardon the one guy that's got all the financial dirt on my dirty company. Uh, <laughs> that one could happen. Preemptive uh, pardon. Um, who's on pardon watch for everybody? And what do you expect? How many? I mean, are we going to get a flurry? Oh, are you kidding? It's going to be it's going to be massive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I well, think- here, but well, here's the thing: these I, the, I'm struggling because I I always do badly watching time travel movies uh, because my brain gets you know it's like what can a preemptive pardon what is what are the implications of a preemptive pardon? For instance, Jared and Ivanka they haven't been charged with anything. I mean they're obviously you know up to their butts and you know all kinds of dirt, but nobody's coming after them. What does a what do Nixon, you is it like, I, like I a think Nixon, the Nixon is sort of the template for the preemptive part. That was a, that was also a very unique situation. It you know well it look the, Trump is a very unique situation. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just <laughs> and, and if you accept it, do you are you essentially admitting that you deserve one? I mean, if somebody said I'm going to give you a pardon, I guess my answer would be for, for what? what i haven't done anything <laughs> no I mean, and I'm thank sure. you for implying that maybe i have I, I, yeah. that's the whole thing why would you put that cloud over my head and suggesting that maybe while i was in your employ in the white house i committed some illegal act well, it doesn't make a lot of sense well, perhaps, a jail for, free card i guess perhaps, perhaps, it's monopoly. perhaps he calls william barr and says okay you're no longer the attorney general tell me uh do i need to do a pardon for uh my family <laughs> and Carl will be like, well, that would be a bad idea. <laughs> you know? I don't know. Uh, well, in the meantime, though, you know, we're, we're they keep telling us they're at the one yard line on a COVID relief bill, um, which looks like it's going to include direct payments to certain individuals. Six hundred dollars per. That's supposed to last, you, I guess, the next six months, uh, just yeah. like the twelve hundred dollars. You know, what's your rent? Uh, what, a hundred dollars a month or something it should last you a long time. Yeah. Six hundred dollars, which is better than nothing. But some protections for small businesses. Uh, local governments not getting anything, state governments. Uh, and, and Susan, I mean, I know this is something that the governor and, and uh, frankly, the legislature have been hoping for, some sort of federal assistance, because the state budget looks like a mess going into next year, doesn't it? Yeah. And it, we're not alone. Um, actually, six of the seven states that are facing the worst financial picture next year are red states. I mean, Florida is a mess. Um, so, you know, Republican governors are in a real bind because they always want to toe the line that they don't want to increase spending or taxes or get a bailout. But we all have to balance our budgets. The feds don't. So everybody really needs help. And for this not to be in the bill, that's a huge problem because people are not real optimistic that Mitch McConnell is going to give Joe Biden anything next year. If, if. He has control of the Senate. And, and the way that the Republicans are handling Georgia right now, that's not a guarantee. Um, that's supposed to vote, right? That's the plan. If you don't vote, that's how they win, right? Well, apparently. 
uh, yes, yeah, so some, something along those lines. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so between the boycott, the vote uh, pushes I've been seeing from some of Trump's uh, most ardent supporters. Um, and then, of course, one. It, it's it's a weird me- balancing act they're trying to. But I, I want to get back to the to the state for just a second. And, and Susan, I mean, there's a lot of people that are hoping that the state comes up with some sort of covid package as well in in the lame duck period here without some sort of federal guarantees, are they even in a position to do anything like extending unemployment benefits and stuff like that? Or are they sort of hamstrung? Well, we do have a surplus of about $400 million, uh, which is pretty much what the governor has asked for. Um, We do have some federal money for vaccine distribution. So that part of it should be covered um, because we do have some leftover federal funding from the CARES Act that was you know, passed like 2 million years ago in the spring. Um, But I I think everybody understands that workers and businesses need some help right now, um, even if it's minimal. It's just the the continued power struggle between the Democratic governor and a Republican legislature. Um, There's a reason why the Senate is meeting right now and the House is supposed to be back on Monday. There's supposed to be a deal. Will it be comprehensive? Well, nothing's been announced, so we have no idea. Ah, well, speaking of Lansing and the important work going on there, I, I do want to talk about this because um, uh, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson basically told the Oversight Committee to shove it. I'm not going to appear at your stupid three ring circus. And I think she was smart to do so. Um, and I think and, it was uh, hilarious that she did so. Well, so. exactly, Nancy. I mean, it seems to me she's like, you know, what's the point in me participating in this? Because if you watched Washington's hearings yesterday and Ron Johnson and, and Gary Peters going after it, <laughs> going after each other yesterday, um, mm-hmm. nothing productive is happening at these. No. What have they gleaned from this hearing in Lansing thus far and all these stupid meetings they have? What have they learned about any of this at this point? Well, actually, I mean, if they just paid attention to the newspapers, they could learn quite a bit. I mean, they did the hand recount yesterday in Antrim County and found, what, 12, a difference, uh, you know, 12 votes moved and that moved in favor of President Trump. So, well, if you just multiply that by all the counties, though, it could mean like 12,000 more votes for. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and, but, you know, I mean, it's like she's right, absolutely right to do this. This is being done, these, these show, it's like a show trial and it's being mm-hmm. done purely to, you know, tickle the fancy of, you know, the maggots out, the maggot heads out there. And that's, that's not her job. I mean, she's got to work on this, you know, 30 minute wait at the secretary, at the branch offices. So, I mean, I don't, I don't blame her for telling them to take a hike. You know what? I, I reached out the other day. I couldn't help it anymore. I was watching Lynn Wood, the, the attorney down in Atlanta, who's been a big you know, idiot. For, yeah, he's been railing for that. And I used to deal with him when I covered the when I was at the Washington Post and I covered the Chandra Levy case. He was representing Gary Condit suing like the National Enquirer and Vanity Fair and stuff. And he was he was, you know, he's the top top rate attorney and he was a gentleman. And I wrote him and I said, you know, it was about midnight when I finally said, I got to write this guy. And I said, I'm just really I've been watching you and I'm just really surprised. And, you know, you're you're a gentleman and a great lawyer. I'm really surprised and disappointed. And he wrote back and said, thanks for the nice words. But he says, Alan, you're going to see we got video. We got affidavits and blah, blah, blah. And I wrote him back and I said, look, I've been covering the stuff in Michigan and the affidavit. The affidavits, I, I don't doubt that people are sincere in writing their affidavits, but they're based on these perceptions and conclusions and conjecture. And I said, I haven't seen any solid evidence. And he's like, you'll you'll see. Well, he also right. is saying, he, you'll see, Alan, I'm charging 1200 bucks an hour for this stuff. And I'm going to ride it out as long as I can. Right. That's yeah. what this is and nothing more. I mean, again, the grift continues. Um, you know, we talked about Georgia. I, I'm all over the place today. I apologize. But did you see the story in the New York Times this week that showed that all the money that Trump is trying to raise for the candidates in Georgia is actually going into his own coffers? None mm-hmm. of it is actually making it I to the it. candidates in Georgia. He's fundraising off of that Senate race in Georgia, and he's keeping the damn money for himself. Right. I got shocked, an email. Shocked, shocked. I, I was looking at an email this morning from the Trump campaign and they're not they're selling some type of christmas stuff and they're not even like putting any pretense out there anymore it's not for anything they just say hey buy some money 
<laughs> buy this Christmas ornament, this Trump Christmas ornament, buy such and such and give $45. They're not even saying what it's for anymore. They're not even <laughs> pretending. Nice. By the way, can I just say this because you you actually had the gall to say that Lynn Wood is a good is a sharp lawyer. <laughs> this is his tweet from earlier this week. Um, I won't read the whole thing, but he's talking about uh, Governor Kemp and the Secretary of State in oh, Georgia. Yeah. He says he gave Brian Kemp and Georgia Secretary of State every chance to get it right. They refused. They will soon be going to jail. Yeah. <laughs> what? what is that? I mean, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of people throwing around these charges like it's just like we're all on the apprentice and we don't mean it. It's just in the script. And, you know, it's like right. this, is, this is real life here. Well, you know what? Rudy Giuliani you know, supposedly used to be a good U.S. attorney and, you know, supposedly a good mayor. But the guys. I think these real. of episodes reveal character. They don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not a. 180 from what he used to be. We just we were fooled before, and now we're not going to be. And now right. we're not. I, I thought that the people that they were targeting were not powerful people. They right. were doing the same tactics, but they were targeting people that we don't really give a shit about. Right. And so when he was doing this stuff in New York, and it wasn't it was targeting poor people who gave a shit. But now he's targeting people who actually people care about. And we're like, oh no, he's a terrible person. He was always a terrible person. Yeah, yeah. Rudy yeah. Giuliani has always been a terrible person, but you know what? I think people also, as they get older, they they like they're like, I don't give a damn. I'm just what? I'm just not pretending anymore. <laughs> well, I'm I'm taking it all, you know. Letting my freak flag fly. Yeah. I, tell you, I tell you, you know who you know who I think actually may have a decent legal case. We're talking about all these stupid legal arguments being made. I think Dominion Voting Systems may have a pretty good case out there right now. Yeah, Their right. company name has been dragged through the mud, yep. and you've got seventy million people now thinking that this is a corrupt company that's from Venezuela. They were Canadian. They now are in Denver, yeah. and they, for what we can tell, have made pretty reliable voting systems yeah. that have been working the way that they're they, supposed to. They need to go full Sandy Hook parents i agree these people and i mean get some more get get a handsome young attorney to be the front the face of this and just go after them and do not stop it's like these people are not going to be i mean they need to be when you're fighting a bully you got to put them down and these people are bullies and they got to go down I think in Antrim County, and maybe you guys can speak better of this, but I mean, they kept saying it was human error. So then they come back and they say, no, no, look, it's the machines. But the human error was that they weren't programmed properly. Right. Garbage in, garbage out. That's, yeah. that's like a first right. rule. Of what me was more disturbing is, of course, what's happening to the company itself, the name of the company, but the targeting of its individual employees mm -hmm. in these places. These, yeah. you know, these young folks who, it's a job for them. They mm -hmm. don't have any sort like it, it's ridiculous. They're unsafe. Their families are unsafe. This is crazy. Well, mm -hmm. crazy is a word that we've bandied about quite a bit this late, this year. Yeah, um, no, it's a drone. Our, <laughs> yeah, our IT contractor. Well, her, their IT contractor, who apparently her job was to clean the screens for one day. Yeah. Was so, one day. Was it really her job to clean the screens? Yeah, yeah she was there to clean the screens, and and yeah. uh, that was yeah. it. So so her I level of expertise. Hire anybody it, with any expertise at all? Right. I mean, I can get a bottle of Windex and a paper towel for God's sake. <laughs> well, speaking of expertise, there's a lot of criticism coming down for some of Joe Biden's picks for cabinet at this point in time. A lot of people saying, "What does Pete Buttigieg know about transportation? What does Jennifer Granholm know about energy?" Well, let's talk about Jennifer Granholm, former Governor Jennifer Granholm. Uh, being appointed uh, to serve in uh, President Biden's cabinet, uh, if, of course, she is approved. That's going to be interesting to see. But but Susan, I mean, the Republicans in Michigan are freaking out about this one. They're like, you can't put Jenny on the block in there. She's the worst governor we ever had, blah, blah, blah. What does she know about this? Well, I mean, frankly, if you are in a state that uh, has to deal with the auto industry on a regular basis, you might know something about cafe standards. <laughs> Well, and green jobs was a huge part of her administration, especially her second term. I mean, you know, if you're going to pick a cabinet position for her, this would be the one. Um, you know, this just comes down to the fact that, you know, she is considered the Antichrist in, in Michigan for Republicans. Um, you know, I... I would think that Whitmer would have overtaken them with, you know, her fascist dictatorship, you know, of health. That's right. but, That's right. um, you know, you, you see all the people come out of the woodwork, every Republican pundit just lost their collective minds. Um, but she and Biden go way back. 
Um, she does have some expertise. She's served on a, a whole lot of boards, you know, with green energy and does have auto connections. So I think it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, I think Buttigieg is, is a pretty interesting appointment. Um, and actually, um, we, we talked with some environmentalists who are, are actually very pleasantly surprised. I mean, sure, he doesn't have a ton of experience, um, but, you know, he is against line five. And that's very interesting to people in Michigan because, of course, DOT oversees the project for pipeline safety. Yeah, and that's Ooh, that's that's a big course. fight to come yet uh, on on the line five. I mean, it's not a done deal, um, but uh, Dana Nessel's digging in her heels on that one too. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, where this thing all goes, um, and and what the UP would do without that supply. I think you could run it through Wisconsin. You never know. Um, Ron Johnson might want a pipeline through a state. You never know. Just let him do that. He has plenty, so why not have go. another one? Actually, line <laughs> five does go through Wisconsin. Uh, well, oh, that's true. You just got to reverse it, I suppose. But mm -hmm. um, so, all right, what do we want to get to next? Because there's so much stuff that's going on. Um, how about this? Before we move on, January 6th, if anybody is sort of following the, the QAnon world and, and some of the theories that are out there for those that are delusional and somehow thinking that uh, Donald Trump can still pull this out somehow and be the next president, uh, be the, well, reelected president. January 6th is the date. That's the date that, of course, Congress will approve uh, what the electors have put before them. And it would take something very, very unusual for this to happen. Uh, in fact, I mean, it's it's like a less than one in one million chance that this would actually work. But the maggots have convinced themselves that this is when it's all going to come down. Just you wait. Donald Trump is still going to be there. That's and the day of the storm. Is that what they call it? That's, yes, storm? exactly. But, but I'm wondering how much disappointment can they take before the bottom sort of falls out in this whole thing and their belief system? At, at what point do they sit there and go, you know what? That purple Kool-Aid doesn't look so good anymore. I don't think I'm going to drink it. They have, they a, worse never do that. Never. They never. have a worse record than the Mets did <laughs> in, in the beginning of their uh, you know, creation. You know what they will do is, first of all, they'll never say that. Because that's the hardest thing in the world for anybody, whether you're, you know, right wing, left wing. I've been right. took. I was wrong. And what's more, I was swindled. I mean, I was, I was, you know, fooled into this because that makes you look bad too. Um, my guess is they'll ignore it. And, you know, it'll be just like, it'll just be like one of those nights that, you know, how when you're out with your friends in a bar and, and like the fun tends to kind of build to a crescendo and then it just that kind used of, to happen. Those yeah, things used to happen. Yeah, I know. Yeah, back then we able to do that. But it's like I think that's what's going to happen. People will just kind of drift away, or they'll go deeper down well, into the rabbit hole. So you know, you know, we in the media just keep trying to play whack a mole with all these conspiracy theories. You know, there's Antrim County, and there's you know Wayne County, and the mysterious suitcases full of votes, and all this stuff. And every time we swap one down a new version of it, you know, pops back up and people don't believe it. And when John F. Kennedy Jr. didn't come back before the election, they just pivoted to something else with QAnon. So, you know, when it doesn't happen on January 6th, they'll come up with something new because people just want to believe something. Well, well my, the, knows, the Mayan calendar might give us well, something, something else to look at, right? Everybody knows the ankle uh, tether that Joe Biden is wearing. It's covering up, <laughs> or the, you know, it's covering up the ankle tether because he was arrested, and so now he's got a little, you know, brace. Yeah, so so the boot, the boot covers up the that, so you can't see that. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm he's sure. on probation. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, this is getting dumb, dumb, dumb. Um. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, so what else do we want to get into? Oh, oh, this was great. Um, I love seeing some of the hand wringing and, and pearl clutching that is going on around some of uh, uh, Joe Biden's appointees so far. Um, uh, I believe it was uh, O'Malley Dillon who actually uh, went on there and was to, one of the campaign managers um, called Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell terrible in an interview once. And I do believe she used the word fuckers at some yeah. point to describe Republicans. And this apparently is disqualifying for some people because she's rude. How can we have, we've seen a couple of instances of this where they're like, well, these people are rude. We can't have them in positions of they're authority. Tweeting. They're Don't tweeting bad things about us. Don't back down. 
never back down to this kind of gaslighting bullshit. Right. And I'm going to say that because we've already broken the F bomb barrier here. Yes. Do not let them get away with it. Say, yep, I called you fuckers. And you know why? That's you deserved it. Are. You know what they need? <laughs> I know who should have been the chief of staff, James Carble. There you go. <laughs> he knows how to, he know he brings a gun to a gunfight. Yeah. Well, bring a, Bring a fucking bazooka but, to this fight. Yeah. Because, but do they uh, think that we don't notice the well, hypocrisy? Yeah, do they, it's, the, it's the oppression Olympics. You know, people are like dying to be oppressed. Like if they cannot get to oppression, what will they do with their lives? <laughs> so uh, I mean, now we're down to like name calling and like not like actual name calling, like some of the things I don't know I've been called in my life, but like being called a fucker, which like I think somebody called me in fifth grade. Yeah, <laughs> like, really have to get like stop giving these people air. This is stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> and there's a huge oh, double standard for women and, yeah. and for people of color. There always is, um, because everything is always worse coming from people who are not straight white males. Yeah. Speaking and, from experience, yeah. perhaps. <laughs> Yes. I mean, what happened to the fuck your feelings crowd? Yeah. I, you know, all of a sudden, they're the most sensitive people in the world. Exactly. And I, I'm sure Susan, I mean, I was a female columnist with my face in the paper four times a week. Susan's been a columnist. Take a look at our email on any given day and tell me about how delicate your sensibilities are. I mean, I've been called as they, uh, as they, as my brother-in-law said, Say everything but a child of God. And that's, but a child of God, that's right. Uh, well, you know, okay, so we've got basically a couple of weeks of this left. Uh, we may get some sort of stimulus relief package coming this week. Um, Lame Duck's been actually kind of interesting. I thought this was interesting. Um, record expungement. Expansion of that. I wasn't expecting to see them the, do that, but it looks like that one's going to actually get signed by the governor, if I'm not mistaken, Susan. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to impact a whole lot of people. And, and you know, especially low level drug offenses, uh, OUI is now going to be uh, included in that as well. Um, and so after a couple of years, you can have that expunged, which is going to be huge for people that are looking for jobs. Yeah. And housing. Yeah. And housing. That's exactly right. And and I mean, yeah. all right. Every once in a while, they do something up there, though, that makes me realize that they do have some sort of empathy for people's situations, some sort of understanding of people's problems. Um, and that gives me this one little glimmer of hope in our system. They'll do something to dash it soon enough, I'm sure. Uh, but what led to this weird little compromise? So this is really probably the most prominent bipartisan victory that we've seen this term. And, you know, this is not the only criminal justice reform that we've seen. You know, um, we, we've seen several packages get through and juvenile justice is part of this one, um, which is really important. And, and they also did uh, the raise the age uh, legislation at the end of last year um, and uh, asset forfeiture, which, you know, funds police departments. So some really good stuff. Um, if, if you want to know why there's agreement on this, um, it starts with money. Yeah, I was uh, going to say, is this a backdoor way to get at the corrections budget? It is. Yes. And oh. look, everybody has their own motivation. Sometimes it's not great, but you get to a good place. That's what politics is, um, at least for, you know, in an imperfect world, which it, we clearly live in. Um, but yeah, I mean, everybody knows the corrections budget is huge. It's always been around $2 billion, far more than higher education. And so, you know, Republicans have come around to the idea that this is a good way to reduce costs. They've worked with the Pew Charitable Trust. This is a huge issue for them. Um, and, and how to, you know, do reforms that their caucus can live with. Yeah, well, and, and again, um, it's amazing how you can reduce the cost in the correction system by keeping people out of jail in the first place um, and, and, and allowing them to actually get hired and get a place to live. Uh, you know, they don't have to turn to crime as much when they have a job. Um, and, I think you know, this is going to make a huge difference in, in cities like Detroit, obviously, in Lansing and, and uh, anywhere else. There are large minority populations because they have been systematically oppressed in the system for a long time um, back in the days when. Somebody looked at the prison system as a moneymaker for the private sector. Again, privatization works in certain fields, but not in healthcare or prisons. I firmly believe that. That's just my way of thinking. Um, well, you know, the, uh, and I don't know if the state law has changed, but when I was at Detroit News, I wrote a story about sheriffs who got a certain budget 
for to feed the inmates and anything that they didn't spend they got to keep so the incentive was to feed prisoners shit like bologna sandwiches and stuff Gruel. And would keep they would keep the money and uh well, that that's is, horrible. You know, and that so sort of the private, about- the private sector of the prison industry is, is set up in the same way. There's yeah. something weird about policy around sheriffs in this country. In Indiana, yeah. sheriffs can take a, uh, are, are charged with collecting um, back property taxes, unpaid property taxes, and they get to actually take a, a piece off the top. Like, you know, it's part in, and, some, in, a, in a big urbanized county, that can be a lot of money. And they just, right. they, oh, it, well, hey, they yeah. look skin, at the whole, you know, the whole like, foreclosure thing. That's something that's, a, that's a discussion for another day because we can get into that for a long time. We, All had, right, a, um, we had a reporter at our paper, though, who used to say, what is this, medieval France? It's like, no, it's Indiana. <laughs> so anyway, well, go ahead. Be, before, we get to, before we get to Schmuck of the Week, um, I wanted <sighs> to give everybody a really important update on a huge lawsuit that, that I have been following for the last several years. Um, there was a man in Michigan that had moved in with his parents in Grand Haven after getting a divorce back in 2016. Oh. And then he moved out and his parents apparently threw out uh, some of his valuables, which included apparently $25,000 worth of pornography. Oh. <laughs> he sued his parents to get it back. His parents said, this stuff is going to ruin you. You don't want this. They were good church going folks. And they threw it all out. The kid said, Hey, my porn collection was worth like 25 grand. And here's the great thing. Three years later, he has now won the case and his parents have to pay him back. <laughs> so he, I mean, so this was like hard copy pornography. This was, yeah, uh, yeah. Magazines, videos, apparently yeah. sex toys. He had all kinds of stuff. Right wow. Wow. Uh, he, you know, it, it, the guy really liked porn. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he went to porn conventions and got autographs and stuff like that. So, well, given um, so much porn is now like on, you know, digital, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm yeah. kind of touched that anybody bothers to collect the hard copy. Maybe it's like the vinyl of, uh, of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But the guy won. I mean, that was the great thing. His parents threw out his stuff. That's like, I could sue my parents for throwing out my old baseball cards. Are you kidding me? Then I <laughs> you know. go back and have a conversation about a particular cabbage patch. Because I still have some real feelings. <laughs> oh, Dad, uh, did you? Oh, did did oh, Mom get rid of one? The way at college, it happened. Yes, it did. Wow. Yeah. Well, why didn't you take it with you? Uh, wow, because I was really <laughs> in a dorm. I didn't have room for Nathaniel. That was the <laughs> cabbage patch on his birth certificate. So Nathaniel. A good spot for me. Oh, uh, well, oh. there you go. And so, there, there, you know, all my old stuff, of course, is gone. But um, yes. anyway, what are you going to do? But uh, anyway, that guy won the case. And I just thought that was important that everybody knew this. So, um, you, you know, rest that. easy. And parents, think twice about throwing out your kid's stuff. Right, <laughs> right. Come back to bite you. All right. Um, we've been going for quite a while. We should probably get to schmucks of the week. And, and I mean, you know, it's getting hard to call them schmucks because some of these people are just plain freaking evil. Well, um, that's a you know, good transition into mine. So, can I go first? Please, Nancy. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little jujitsu here um, because you'll see in a minute why. Um, my my nominee is uh, what is his name? Victor Gevers, who pr- probably pronounces his name Gavers because he is Dutch and he lives in the Netherlands, and um, he is what we call what we would call an ethical hacker, and he apparently was able to crack the president's. Twitter account by guessing the password. Okay. Oh. And he took screenshots of kind of the back room at Twitter so to prove that he did it, um, but did not mess with it, did not mess with the account or delete it or do anything like that. And would anybody like to guess what the president's? Oh, <laughs> I, 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 don't, <laughs> I mean, it could go so many ways. Oh. I saw this. So Mega I would 2020 exclamation points. Wow. <laughs> So I'm wow. calling him. I'm only calling him a schmuck because he didn't go in there and delete the account. So that's yeah. well, you, know, you, know, you know, but he could be, he could face charges for something like that. But but the fact well, that he just I mean he could does, anyway. He, but he's I in lo- the Netherlands. What do, what do the Dutch police care about Donald Trump's Twitter account for Christ? So sake? now it's going to be MAGA 2021 exclamation point 2024 <laughs> probably or yeah, that's right. you know whatever. But yeah, change one number you know because that's what we all like to do. It like, can't be like using password one two three for your. But you know, 
I'm, I'm kind of disappointed nobody else did it before this guy. Well, period. the fact that nobody tried. I mean, if you can't log in as <laughs> Donald Trump, and how much fun could you have had with that? My password at the Detroit News was for a long time was just dog. <laughs> no matter how messed up I am, sign in and remember. I that. didn't know they had passwords for those old uh, Underwoods. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> The typewriter password, I've never heard of such a thing. That's right, that's right. <laughs> uh, who wants to go next with their schmuck of the week? Uh, I'll go. I'll, go ahead. I'll, I'll say Senator Ron Johnson. I, I mean, that, that was uh, one that was on my list. Just so, so shameful. I mean, what these people are doing to this country is just so, you know, it's an abomination, and he is just really... I, 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 I didn't have high expectations, but I still thought he was a little better than that. But. Well, no, I didn't. What, what <laughs> evidence have you had every, throughout his tenure as a senator from the great state of Wisconsin that he was better than that? I mean, I, I lived in Wisconsin as a little kid for a little while. I still have friends who live in Wisconsin. Uh -huh. They're ashamed of this guy and they're yeah. Republican. Um, yeah. You know, it, Wisconsin's better than this. They're better than well, this. Maybe, they, I, they, they, maybe. They've been really trying hard to prove that they're not over the last few years with people like Scott Walker and that stupid Supreme Court that they've got in that state that basically right. will do whatever kind of somersaults they can to get the result they're looking for. Wisconsin has gone down a rabbit hole of stupidity in these last few years that is really right. shameful for the Badger right. State. And I hope for Madison's sake, because Madison is a wonderful community and that university is fantastic. I hope for Madison's sake that they can shake off, shake off the stupid because well, it makes Michigan look like a, a bastion of, of uh, you know, yeah. of brilliance. Right. Well, maybe maybe I should uh, change that and say I nominate me for the schmuck of the week thinking that Ron Johnson was better than that. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. I appreciate it. Uh, who wants to go next? So let's see, Candace. Who do you got? I knew you were going to pick on me. Well, you want to go last? I'll go. I'll go next if you want. No, I'll definitely. Okay. I'll, I'll go now. So, um, mine is for. I don't know if you all saw the Texas Monthly story about the wedding photographer. I saw that. Yes. You no. Fill me in. Great. So there's this incredible story in Texas Monthly about a wedding photographer. She's at the wedding. It's during COVID, so this was recent. They've taken necessary precautions and the bridesmaids out. They've been in the room taking pictures with the bridesmaids and the bride for about an hour. One of the bridesmaids says to the bride, um, I'm so glad that you still decided to come considering everything that's happening with the groom. The groom tested positive for COVID-19 the day before and nobody in this wedding decided that we should cancel this wedding and not have these vendors come in. And so the photographer decides to back out of the wedding in the middle, of course, and they get mad at the photographer. And she then, contra of course, tests positive for COVID-19 because, of course, she did. She has asthma and three kids at home. And when she eventually talked to the wedding, the bride and groom after, they were, they doubled down on their terribleness. And they were like, you know, well, I mean, he didn't have any symptoms. Did you, but Candace, you're leaving out what is probably the best single quote in that piece, which is when the photographer was packing to go, she said, I can't be around this anymore. I've got to leave. And one of the bridesmaids said, well, why? And she goes, you know, I think she said, I have asthma and I have three children at home. And <laughs> the bridesmaid replied, but this is her wedding. Bridezilla. <laughs> <laughs> right, there you go. Exactly. It's the bridezilla. Honestly, I think we should outlaw weddings. After, like, I'm talking about, like, not during COVID. I mean, like, after this, weddings should be outlawed. And I'm not even married yet. And I think weddings should be outlawed. <laughs> I have to say, I've known a couple, three couples that have gotten married in this last year. And almost all of them had to have a much reduced, uh, you know, wedding to what they originally had hoped for. And yet, they were great weddings. I mean, it's there's something about only having... 10 people around you, you know, your absolute the core of the core and or doing it outside or you know, oh, saving a lot of money. It looked like really nice, you know, you weren't being dragged around from table to table, you know, getting your picture taken a million times, not having a chance to talk to anybody. It was like a smaller, more meaningful wedding. 
Either I'm going to have the smallest wedding ever. You all are going to get invited to Kobo. I mean, <laughs> there's no two ways at this point. <laughs> well, until that day comes. Um, <laughs> I'm a long, uh, long, 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 long way away. <laughs> uh, well, you never know. You know, you, the, the, the person of your dreams could be right around the corner. Yeah. And the case, you got to go outside and find them. Um, and that's dangerous to do right now. Uh, Susan Demas, what do you got? Um, I am going to nominate State Senator Lana Tice, who's Ooh. from Livingston County. Uh, she was on one of those oversight committees that's been holding the kangaroo courts over the election. Um, and uh, this week, the Dominion CEO was there and totally seriously, in front of God and everyone, asked him, I understand that you've recently come into a lot of money. He was just spewing out these weird conspiracy theories that we see on message boards and apparently believes them. Uh, got some commendation from President Trump in the mail, you know, for spreading all of this, but has like no qualms about putting this out there in the public realm and looking utterly ridiculous. Ugh. Yeah. Well, that tells you what kind of media she's consuming, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, I think of that whenever I see, you know, because I've lived in, like a lot of people, I've lived in a few places now, and my Facebook network tends to be clustered, you know, these are the people I know from Indiana, these are the people I know from Ohio, et cetera. And um, somebody on the from the Indiana cohort uh, posted something about, uh, well, according to Patrick Kolbeck, who is an uh, Microsoft, who is a former oh, rocket scientist not. and Microsoft certified cybersecurity expert. And I'm like, okay, don't, it's like, just stop right there. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about Pat Colbeck. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, but that's, that's I mean, that, but that's, they read that somewhere. I mean, they, they read that probably in Gateway Pundit or. Well, you know, you know, here's the interesting thing. I mean, even Newsmax has started calling him president elect Biden and, and that's got to sting. That's yeah. got to sting the president just a little bit. Um, <laughs> Because once Newsmax turns, then it's just a matter of time for OAN follows suit. And uh, when that yeah. day happens, I mean, you know, the pyramid comes crumbling down. All right. So I've got a couple of people that I wanted to get into here. Um, just because, first of all, this this cop in Texas. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Mark Anthony Aguirre or Aguirre, probably. But uh, Mark Aguirre, of course, used to play for the Pistons. Different guy. This is a former Houston cop. Um he was paid like a lot of money, like a quarter million dollars by some right wing organization to go for uh, people that were committing election fraud. So he pulls some guy over a black SUV. He's driving a black SUV and he sees this guy in this van and he pulls him over saying that he's part of this huge election conspiracy. Some poor guy who basically was just an air conditioning repairman gets pulled over and held by this cop at gunpoint until the police can come and rescue this poor guy who hadn't done anything other than go service the air conditioning unit at some place. There were they no ballots. That, you know, there were 750,000 ballots in the van is what he was alleging were in there. Yeah. They took his, he had accomplices who took the guy's truck and drove it to a, a <laughs> another place so that they could search it. Yeah. And all they found in there were a bunch of air conditioning parts. Tools, so, tools for yeah. air conditioning repair. Right. So right. that was one guy, but, but actually I'm going to give it to Rand Paul. And here's the reason. Rand Paul, first of all, is just you know, Rand Paul. But he was in an interview on Fox Business with uh, Maria Bartiromo the other day, who is just a wonderful host for any of you that watch Fox Business. Um, but he was saying he was going after Georgia for sending out absentee ballot applications. And here's what he actually said. This is the quote. He said, I'm very, very concerned that if you solicit votes from typically non-voters, that you will affect and change the outcome. <laughs> You he might said the part out loud that when you actually get people to show up to vote, Republicans' chances of winning go way down. Yeah, that is the problem. Rand Paul acknowledged it publicly. I wonder who he's talking about. Well, he was talking, mm. of course, about the Secretary of State Republican and the Governor <laughs> in Georgia Republican, who are not doing enough to suppress the damn vote. <laughs> he basically was saying we need to suppress the vote. Well, what, I'm curious. What's what's everyone's thought on the the uh, the senator races? In Georgia, is there any chance of the Democrats winning? I 
look, I mean, from what I'm seeing, early turnout is huge already. The number of people who are looking to vote absentee is huge. They're seeing, especially for a runoff election, and they have had these in Georgia before. So it's not as if people don't know how this works. But the numbers they're seeing are surprising. A lot of people coming out of the woodwork and seeing how close those races were. I think there's a lot of Democrats out there who are saying, wait, if I actually show up this time, we can tip the scales. Um, Again, typically non-voters, people saying, maybe, maybe my vote might make a difference this time. And with the discontent in the Republican Party over this election result and whether or not to even trust the system, uh, they could shoot themselves in the foot, I think. Yeah. I, and I think, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's your turn. Also, there is a lot of great grassroots organizing happening on the ground in Atlanta. And I think that that cannot be understated how important that work is, that door to door. And Atlanta is not really shut down the way it needs to be. That's another story for another day. Since it's not, I mean, they're organizing in a a really powerful way on the ground. So I I, I, Stacey Abrams doing a great job. She is. She is. is. And a a lot of other women who are backing up her work as well on the ground. Right. So I, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to be interested to see. I think the numbers are there for the Democrats if the turnout is where it needs to be. I mean, I think they have the citizenry to get it done. Um, but again, it's a massive turnout effort in a special election. Uh, but with, I mean, I, let's be honest, Purdue and Leffler are not doing themselves any favors either. Those just I mean, you know, grifters, grifters, grifters. It's always easy to beat them. It really is amazing. I mean, to, to I, I wonder, well, I'm not surprised that they got elected in the first place, but I mean, you're right. They are, what What a couple of... Well, she was not elected, right? Wasn't she appointed? Yeah, she was appointed. Yeah, she was appointed. Yeah. So, Every time I mean, she looks like a giraffe. She, she looks like a slightly more well-nourished Ann Coulter. She what tries to make, come off as a self-made person, but she's... Oh, my God. I know. Person. Yeah. I know. There's no such thing. <laughs> you didn't you didn't build that you're right point taken point taken by candace and she's absolutely right there is no such thing um all right so we've got to wrap it up though it's been it's been a fun hour everybody i really do appreciate it and a quick reminder we're not going to be doing the show next friday it is christmas day again i gotta do my dickensian sort of thing there um because you know it's christmas and uh, everybody should get a break from us especially on christmas day with the exception of our families and i'm apologizing to mine right now um you may or may not see me on christmas day we'll see if we can well, travel. You know, back, um, go ahead. I was going to say, for many, many years at the Detroit News and the Washington Post, the Jews were Christmas Day. And so I always said at the Detroit News, there was a guy, Bruce Alpert, he says, you know, he goes, you know, the myth that the Jews control, he was from New York, the myth, <laughs> the myth that the Jews control the media, well, today it's true. <laughs> and I'd say, okay, let's let's mark up the front page, top story, top ten Jews who made a difference this year. Let's do the headline: Jews didn't kill Jesus. Take over. Yeah, yeah, you're still writing song. You're still writing stories about Christmas. Uh, you know, even right. even on that day. Well, uh, but anybody have have a great holiday, everyone. Um, hopefully, you'll get a chance to to do something meaningful with your family. Uh, you know, traveling's probably not on the agenda for a lot of us, uh, given what's going on. But um, I do wish everybody a happy holiday, even those of you who hold different political opinions than I do. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy holidays. Hope your Hanukkah was great, which just wrapped up last night, as a matter of fact. Right. And um, and so uh, it's time. It's time for everybody to sort of regroup and, and uh, get ready for the next year. A uh, reminder, we will do the year that was it's probably going to be like Thursday of, of uh, the week after Christmas or something like that. So we'll be back in a little less than two weeks for that. So that should be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Huge thanks to uh, the Greenhouse and Wald Lake for sponsoring this program. That's a big deal. Appreciate it. Also, Michael Lucido for engineering this broadcast. And, of course, thank you to my panelists, Alan Langle and Nancy Derringer of Deadline Detroit. We appreciate it. Susan Demas of the Michigan Advance, michiganadvance.com. Great stories there all the time. Is it .com or .org? I always get it mixed it's up. It's .com. It is dot com. That's what I thought. You know, it, it matters because you can't get that stuff yeah. wrong. And also Candace Portman of Outlier Media. Candace, again, tell people where they can text if they want Detroit specific local stuff. Yeah, you can text Detroit to seven three two two four. There you go. Get stuff right to your phone. It's a big deal. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great uh, holiday. And Alan, stay home safely. <laughs> My name's M.L. Elric. I'm an investigative reporter and a connoisseur of fine yogurts. I know a little bit about Detroit. I know a little bit about deadlines. And I'm asking you to become a member of DeadlineDetroit.com. Like me, I'm not asking you to do anything I wouldn't do. 
I'm making a monthly donation. My wife is making a monthly donation. I know that seems redundant, but they need the money and the money goes to a good place. Getting the story out, getting the truth out. Because if we don't support local journalism, there's some people a couple blocks away from here who are gonna get away with a whole bunch of stuff that's gonna cost you a whole lot more than just a few bucks out of your pocket every month. Go to DeadlineDetroit.com, become a member. You'll see it's really easy at the top of the website. Give early, give often, give generously. Just give a damn. That's the best way I know how. Stressed out? Need sleep? The cold weather bringing out those aches and pains or arthritis? There's never been a better time to try cannabis. Check out the greenhouse of Wald Lake and learn about the natural way to relax and escape all that 2020 stress. The greenhouse is locally owned and they love helping people who are new to cannabis. They've got a great flower selection of the best Michigan grown buds and the biggest pre-roll selection around. Don't want to smoke? No problem. There's vape carts, tinctures, concentrates, and everyone's favorite, edibles, like gummies, chocolates, peppermint bark, breath sprays, even the original Mackinac Island fudge. So check out the greenhouse of Wald Lake. 21 and over welcome, no med card needed. They also offer senior and veterans discounts and have a great loyalty rewards program. The Greenhouse of Wald Lake, that's greenhousemi.com.